Oh, hi, here's Gideon from the Netherlands. We met at the International Physics and Astronomy Educator Program that was organized at LIGO Hanford in the summer of 2023 by the unsurpassed Amber Strunk and her team of Cassidy and Mackenzie. My role at the program was to give a lecture on general relativity and how one can build up this theory almost exclusively from Newton's laws alone. I also did a Q&A on more technical aspects of general relativity and I got to speak about the Einstein Telescope Education and Experience Center that colleagues and myself are building in the Netherlands as we speak and that we will have delivered by the summer of 2024. I really enjoyed my time at the program as I got to meet all of you and have many interesting discussions on gravity, physics and the teaching of physics. I want to thank the organization for having me and all of you for the many good talks that we had. I was happy to give my lectures and I also learned a lot from you. I really had a blast. Now, during those discussions, some of you asked me whether I could make my presentation and narrative available for you in such a way that you can go through it and potentially use some of it in your own classes. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to go through my presentation one more time and since it is recorded, you can pause it at any moment that you want or at your leisure, go back a few slides whenever you want. Now, since I have the opportunity, I will also have some extras added to it. And there's two types of extras actually. I've included some slides in which I discuss some views on didactics. That is, every now and then I will say, remember what we just discussed? Here's one way that I think you can present this to your high school students. The other type of extra is mathematical. Some of you asked me about the formulas or the more technical details on the mathematics or relativity. And for these, I'm adding some side videos, an expansion pack, if you will, in which I go through the derivation of formulas in step-by-step -step detail. If you want to go through them, please look out for a circle with a number in it that points you to the right video, like this example here, that would invite you to view the side video number one. These circles also designate the technical level by the presence of stars. One star means that a high school student should have no problem with it. Two stars means that it is at, well, first or second uh, year college level. And three stars will mean high technical level. Now feel free to skip them altogether too, of course, if you want. The main narrative of this presentation follows just as well without the formulas. Having said that, let's get started proper with the presentation that I gave at the educator program. In my original presentation, I started with this slide to introduce myself and my background a little, but since we've gotten to know each other well during our stay at Hanford, there's not really a point to linger here. I will, however, say a few things about Maastricht University. If you look at the upper left side of this slide, you see a map of this tiny country that is the Netherlands, and you can also see its capital city in boldface. This is where I was born and raised. And if you go all the way to the south, you will see in the red circle the city of Maastricht, close to both the German and Belgian border. And this, of course, is where Maastricht University is located. From the educational side, we teach our fundamental sciences in the so-called Maastricht Science Program, which is an interdisciplinary curriculum where we have students from all over the world studying biology, chemistry, engineering, mathematics and physics with us. In fact, about 80% of our students do not come from the Netherlands, so our program is fully taught in English and is highly international. I'm also proud to note that as of 2018, all the way to the current year, we have been voted one of the top rated programs in the Netherlands. By the by, what I was just saying is not meant as a marketing pitch. We already have more students applying to study with us than we can actually place. Uh, but if you do, of course, have students who might be interested to study with us, we would be very honored to have them apply. On the research side, Maastricht University has two lines of fundamental physics in our group of gravitation waves and fundamental physics. One is on particle physics, as we are affiliated with CERN, the LHCB experiment to be exact, and the other is on general relativity and the measuring techniques of gravitational waves. Now we house the so-called ET Pathfinder, the R&D facility in which the newest technologies for precise measurements are developed that will be used in the Einstein telescope. It focuses, amongst other areas, on noise reduction, mirror technology, lasers, vacuum systems, so on and so forth, and some data analysis and algorithms and theoretical physics. The ET Pathfinder is the key laboratory in Europe for this type of R&D, and of course we're very proud to have it housed at Maastricht University, although it is a collaboration between many universities and industry institutes. 
In the left panel, you can actually see the Pathfinder. It's a mini version of the Einstein telescope in its clean room. You can see some technologies being installed as we speak. And in the right panel, uh, you will see our group leader, Professor Stefan Hield, an expert in this area, giving a tour to a very prominent guest. And some eagle-eyed watchers might have recognized this gentleman. It's Professor Robert Dijkgraaf, who is a leading string theorist, and who was also the previous director of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. So the American viewers might recognize him as such. Uh, he since returned to the Netherlands to become the Minister of Science and Education. And <laughs> it's one of the few times that I know of where a minister actually knows the topic of their department. <laughs> now, uh, very eagle-eyed people might also spot me somewhere in the photo. Of course, I'm not a minister, but I happen to be on the photo someplace too, if you know where to find me. All joking aside, having said a few things about Maastricht University, let's go to the topic at hand. Now, with the current network of LIGO Virgo Kagra and with future telescopes like Einstein Telescope and LISA and the Cosmic Explorer, we really live in the era of gravitational wave astronomy, and that makes us learn a lot about the universe that could not be measured by light or optical telescopes. With the current network, it ended its third observation run and is now in its fourth observation run, you typically measure about one gravitational wave per week with many more on the way as the current detectors are continuously being updated. Now my plan of this presentation is to understand gravitational waves and general relativity. So that will be our main goal. Let's derive general relativity and as one of its implications, gravitational waves. But opposed to what we typically think, one does not necessarily need to go through all of the mathematics to grasp the key points, the physics of general relativity rather than the tensory stuff. So we will do just that. We will derive general relativity almost exclusively from first principles alone. This might make this narrative useful in secondary school classes as well, if you so want. In fact, we will see that a good understanding of Newton's laws, most notably the first law, will be enough of a good starting point to get all the way to general relativity without the tensors. General relativity is a theory of gravity, and as you will see, our derivation will be heavily built on Newtonian mechanics. In fact, we will see that we'll hardly need anything more than Newtonian mechanics to get to the heart of general relativity and to derive the bulk of it. So, let's take a few slides to go through some Newtonian physics and to set the stage to build up general relativity from it. Isaac Newton famously published his Principia Mathematica in 1687, a book in which he showed how you can understand motion by what we now call Newton's laws. In the Principia, he also derived a formula for universal gravity and did so by a blend of geometry and calculus. And, somewhat unappreciated, he also hammered home the notion that nature can be understood by mathematics. And his book truly was a great revolution in scientific thinking. Let's review Newton's laws. Newton's second law tells you how to calculate the acceleration, A, of a mass, M, when you know the net force, F, acting on it. The third law tells you that every force knows a counterforce, in the opposite direction but with equal magnitude. And really this is just the conservation of momentum, one of the most holy laws of physics in classical and quantum mechanics. In the Principia, Newton actually also introduces two extra statements that say that space and time are always the same, immovable and independent of anything. And of course, we know from relativity that this is certainly not true. But what about the first law, as I didn't mention it yet? Sometimes Newton's first law is introduced as eh, only a special case of the second law. After all, if the net force is put to zero in F equals m times a, then the velocity is constant. And doing so in three directions makes it a straight line too, giving you the first law. So it really does look like you might as well drop the first law altogether, because if you have the second law, you automatically get the first law as a special case, when f is zero. But this is wrong. There is something that the first law can do where the second law utterly fails. And understanding what this is will be key to build up general relativity, so we're going to spend some slides discussing this in detail. We'll start with a question. Do Newton's laws always hold? Now, of course, we know that they stop holding when things go really fast, because then relativity takes over, or when masses are very small, because then quantum mechanics takes over. 
but that's not what I mean. The question is, everyday objects at everyday velocities, do Newton's laws always hold to correctly predict their motion? And the answer is no. To show this, let's look at two corner systems. One in blue is painted on some train tracks and the other in red is painted on the floor of a train cart. And I'm going to place a mass, let's make it a ball, on position four in both systems. Now here's the thing, I will make the train and tracks have a relative acceleration, A. This is the premise of the situation. Now note that the net force on the ball is zero in both frames. In vertical direction, the gravitational force is exactly balanced by the normal force of the floor back on the ball. And in horizontal direction, there is no force at all. So according to Newton's second law, the ball should not accelerate in either of the two frames. And if we say that it started with velocity zero in both frames, it should stay at location four in both frames. But if the red and the blue system have a relative acceleration, the ball cannot stay at location four in both frames. For instance, if it stays at four in the red frame, it will accelerate to the right as seen along the axis of the blue frame. But then again, if it stays at four in the blue frame, it will accelerate to the left as seen along the axis of the red frame. So no matter how you slice it, at least in one of the two frames, the ball will not follow Newton's second law. The issue is not just semantics. It lays bare that there exist frames in which Newton's laws hold, called inertia frames, and there exist frames in which they don't, called non-inertia frames. Now how to identify which of the two frames here is very important to build up the theory of relativity, so we will come back to it in a few slides from now. But for the moment, we will simply assume by premise that it is the blue frame that is the inertial frame. Having established the notion of inertial frames, we can now ask the following question. What happens in non-inertial systems? If Newtonian mechanics does not work there, what do we do? The answer is something that we can see in this example. If the ground frame, again by premise, is an inertial system, then in the train frame, the ball is seen accelerating. So someone in the train frame will conclude that there is a force acting on the ball. We call such a perceived force a fictitious force. These are really different from real forces like electromagnetism or the spring force or something, because those require an interaction of the ball with something from the outside world. Something from the outside should be pushing or pulling on the ball. But in our example, that is not the case. There was a net force of zero. So a fictitious force in that sense is not real. Nothing is really pushing or pulling the ball. The acceleration that you see is just that we are trying to describe the ball from a non-inertial frame. Another example of a fictitious force we will derive now, the famous centrifugal force. It's a force that you feel when you are on a merry-go-round and you're being flung outward as it spins around. I will derive its formula in a few key steps, and if you want to see the full derivation, you can view the side recording video number one. And if you want to learn more about fictitious forces, any good university book on classical mechanics will tell you all about them. But I also find that the English Wikipedia page has a surprisingly good and succinct entry on them too. Okay, let's go to the merry-go-round. We will start with a schematic picture of the overhead of the merry-go-round. Here, given with the blue axes, that's the merry-go-round system. And in black axes, you will see the ground system, which I'm going to take by premise as an inertial system. Now we took a snapshot where these two X and Y axes overlap perfectly, and that gives us the left panel. I'm going to take a mass. Let's again make it a ball, moving upward in that picture, and let's track it as it moves. I'm going to assume that there's no forces acting on that ball, and that means that in the black system, because it's an inertial system, the ball will move with constant velocity in a straight line. So a snapshot later in the right panel, the mass will be somewhat higher up. Now in that same amount of time, the merry-go-round has rotated a little as indicated here by the fact that the blue axis have rotated a little bit outward. Now note that the mass is still at location x equals r in the black system, but in the blue system, the mass will not be at x equals r anymore but slightly outward from it. And that amount I'm going to call delta r. 
So as measured from the blue axis, the mass has moved outward. So the people used in the blue x-axis will therefore conclude that there was a force acting on the ball pulling it outward. And again, there isn't. The ball is happily moving along with constant velocity in a straight line, but it's just that the people in the blue system are trying to view this motion from a non-inertia frame. So they will see a fictitious force acting on the ball pulling it outward. We can easily derive a formula for this force. If only we can find an expression for delta r, we will know how much the ball has moved along the blue x-axis. And then if we take two time derivatives of that, we will get the acceleration along the blue x-axis. And if you multiply that with m, you will get the fictitious force. So let's follow this program. We can find an expression for delta r by drawing a triangle, here done in red. The hypotenuse of this triangle is equal to r plus delta r. The horizontal side of the triangle is equal to r, and the vertical side is how much the mass has moved upward in the time delta t between the two snapshots, v times delta t. Using now Pythagorean's theorem and rearranging a bit, we will find this formula. And if you then say that the amount of time between the two snapshots, delta t, is very, very small indeed, then the ball cannot have moved much in that amount of time, so that makes delta r a small number. And the square of a small number is even smaller still. So by that approximation, we can completely neglect delta r squared. And if we do that, we will end up with this formula here that gives us our desired expression for delta r. Now, if throwing away delta r squared bothers you, note that the only thing that we were doing is taking the limit. And that's okay here, because in a moment, we're going to take a derivative, two actually, with respect to time to find the acceleration. And by definition, a derivative means that we take all distances and amount of time to be very, very small indeed. But if you're still bothered by this, inside video one, I do the derivation without such shenanigans. We'll get the same answer, it's completely correct mathematics, but if you want to see a more algebraic way of getting to this expression, you can view that in the video. Now, no matter how we do it, we have now found delta r, and we can take its two time derivatives, and that gives us the acceleration of the mass as measured along the blue x-axis. And that acceleration is v squared over r. Now, if you multiply this with the mass of the ball, that gives you the well-known formula for the centrifugal force. So in this example, we explicitly see that the centrifugal force is not a real force. It's a fictitious force. It's just that the mass is happily moving along in a straight line, but viewed from a non-inertial system of the merry-go-round. Now let's apply this fictitious force. Let's look at the Earth-Moon system, and we can do this in two ways. Let's assume that the Earth is an inertial system. By the way, it isn't in actuality, but for the sake of simplicity for my example, I'm going to assume that it is. If the Earth is an inertial system, then from the earth corner system, there's only one force acting on the moon, gravity pulling it in. But since in this frame, the moon tries to move in a straight line, pulling on it perpendicularly with gravity will make it go through the middle. And if you keep this up, you will end up with a nice circular orbit. However, from the moon corner system, which is a non-inertial frame, there will be two forces acting on it. There will be gravity, but also for the fictitious force that we derived one slide ago. So as seen from the moon system, it's the balance between gravity and the fictitious force that keeps the moon in a circular orbit. Newton actually used an example like this to derive his own universal law of gravity. Taking the moon system and knowing about the fictitious forces, he knew that the unknown formula for gravity, Fg, must be given as this balance equation. The fictitious force should completely cancel out whatever the gravitational force is. Next, he made use of the astronomical observations by Johannes Kepler in Tycho Brahe that in a system like this, the amount of time to make one revolution of the two objects around each other squared is proportional to the distance between these two objects cubed. This is what we now call Kepler's third law. And if you massage this law a little bit, you can derive that the moon's orbital velocity v squared is proportional to 1 over r. And if you then substitute this back into the balance equation, you immediately find that gravity is given by 1 over r squared. Now you might wonder where big M came from. 
Small m came in because we had to multiply the centrifugal acceleration with the mass of the moon in our example to make it a force. But where did big M, the mass of the Earth, come from? Well, that's because of Newton's third law. How strongly the moon pulls on the Earth is equal to how strongly the Earth is pulling on the moon. So the formula should be such that the two masses can be swapped around without changing the value of the force. And that gives you m times m. And the result, of course, is Newton's universal law of gravity. And that's how he derived it and wrote it up in his Principia. So here we are. Newton, by understanding inertial systems, non-inertial systems, and fictitious forces, was able to derive his famous gravity law. And this, along with the three laws of motion, was the basis of mechanics for almost three centuries and could even explain the motion in the solar system, up to some very minor differences that needed general relativity to get fixed. So we derived a formula for gravity now. Before we continue, let's make a small detour. We have introduced the notion of inertial systems and we can now come back to that question from before. Why is Newton's first law not just a special case of the second law? What is it that Newton's second law cannot do that the first law can? And the answer is that the first law can identify inertial systems, something that the second law utterly fails to do. We will discuss this now in a few slides. We have seen that if you are in a non-inertial system, there will be fictitious forces. So in such a system, Newton's second law will not just have the actual real forces on one side, but also the fictitious forces. Now, if you want to find out whether a coordinate system is an inertial system, we will have to find out whether f fictitious equals zero. If it is, then it was an inertial strain. Let's do an experiment and let a mass fly about under some forces. We measure the acceleration, A, we know the mass, M, and with that we have found the right-hand side of this Newton's second law. But the left-hand side has two unknowns, the real forces, F real, and the fictitious forces, F fictitious. And that's a mathematical impossibility, because we have one equation with two unknowns in it. For example, A plus B equals 10 cannot tell you how much of that 10 is hidden in A and how much of it is in B, let alone to find out whether A or B is zero. So we cannot use the second law to find out whether the fictitious force is zero and therefore whether we are in an inertial frame or not. Newton's second law fails. This is actually a fun assignment to give to a classroom. You can ask the students, can you come up with an experiment that, using only Newton's second law, reveals whether you are in an inertial system or not? They might come up with something like what we see on this slide. Let's take a wind-up car, the kind that has a spring inside of it that can be wound up, and as it unwinds, it will make the car move along a track. Knowing the real forces that act on the mass, we can calculate, using the second law, at what time the car should cross the finish line, here designated by the flagpole. Then we do the experiment. If the car indeed passes the flagpole at the calculated time, and of course we're assuming that no mistakes were made in the calculation, then you know that there was no fictitious force and we were in an inertial frame. And if the car does not pass the flag at the calculated time, then you can deduce that there was a fictitious force acting on it and we were not in an inertial frame. That sounds very waterproof, but unfortunately this will not work. And that's because we made a secret assumption in this battle plan. We assumed that we knew the forces on the car beforehand. Here, the spring force of the spring that makes the car go. But that means that we had to measure this force beforehand. And how would we have done that? Well, you would think by winding up the spring, measuring the acceleration of the car, putting it back into Newton's second law to find the force F spring. But that we can only do if we already knew that there were no fictitious forces, because otherwise our measuring of the acceleration will not just give us F spring, it will also tell us something about the fictitious force. And that's circular reasoning. The only way to know F spring beforehand to find out whether there is a fictitious force is by doing a measurement, assuming that there was no fictitious force. There is no point in asking the spring manufacturer to tell you the force beforehand, because that means that they had to know that they were in an inertial frame before they measured the force of the spring. Okay, now how about the people that supplied the materials from which the spring was made? 
Well, then they had to have been in an inertia frame to have found the spring constant. So no matter how you try, someone down the chain must have known that they were in an inertia frame to supply you with the constants to have known F spring before you can do this big experiment. So, Newton's second law cannot find inertia frames. How then to do it? You will remember that the issue is mathematical. You have only one measured number, n times a, but you have two unknowns, and that's impossible to solve. But what if we simply remove one of the two unknowns? Then we would have one measured number and only one unknown, and that, of course, can be solved. Now, since we don't know yet whether f fictitious is zero, that's exactly what we try to figure out, we cannot remove that one. But what we can do is make sure that there are no real forces acting on your mass. Then, the mathematics of the second law has only one unknown, f fictitious. And hence, now we can identify whether it is zero or not by doing an experiment. And what I just did is just simply describe Newton's first law. And in this light, Newton's first law can be seen not as a special case of the second, but as a prescription, a test. This is what you need to do to determine whether the fictitious forces are zero. Shut down all real forces and try to measure acceleration. So Newton's first law is not a special case of the second, it's a prescription to figure out whether you are in an inertia frame or not. And it is for this reason that Newton, the man, the scientist, called his law the first law. Only if a coordinate system has been identified as an inertial system, only then do you get to move on and use the second and third laws. This is why it stands before the other two. It's the first step that you have to do before doing mechanics. Okay, after all these details, let's go back to the question we originally started with. What happens if you do mechanics from a non-inertia frame? And the answer is now clear. You will find yourself with fictitious forces. And this was known for a few centuries already by Galileo, by Newton, and all of their contemporaries. Jumping to the early 20th century, Einstein came up with a new realization regarding fictitious forces. First, let's note that acceleration due to a fictitious force is independent of mass. We saw that already in the special case of the centrifugal force. Its acceleration was v squared over r, and that is the same for all objects. Mass, or the other properties of the object, simply do not factor into the formula for the acceleration due to the centrifugal force. And this is true for all fictitious forces. All objects, regardless of their mass or composition, get the exact same acceleration if they are subject to a fictitious force. But, and here was Einstein's thought, this is also true for acceleration due to the gravitational force. So Einstein equated these two to each other. Gravitational forces and fictitious forces are fundamentally indistinguishable from each other. If you go to a non-inertia frame, you feel a fictitious force, but you cannot tell that it's not a gravitational force because they have the exact same property. This realization forms the heart of general relativity, and Einstein was so happy with it that he called it the happiest thought of his life. In brief, it states that when you go in between inertia systems, nature gives you back gravity. So you can see gravity as the price that you have to pay for trying to do physics in a non-inertia frame. But wait, does gravity make everything fall with exactly the same acceleration? Well, we certainly teach our students that. When we drop something close to the surface of the Earth, we teach our students that the acceleration is, in the metric system, equal to 9.81 meter per second squared, regardless of object. And we can easily measure that this is true. Drop two objects in a classroom and make sure that they have the same amount of air pressure. What I used to do in my classes is let a student drop a sheet of paper and something heavy, like a pouch of sand. The paper would gently flow to the floor, but then I let the student crumple up the sheet of paper to make the air resistance the same as the pouches, and then I had them repeat the experiment. And now paper and pouch would indeed fall with exactly the same acceleration, 9.81 meter per second squared. Or you can just remove air pressure altogether, as they do in this demonstration in this video. Here they took a vacuum chamber, a very big one, and they had a bowling ball and a feather drop at exactly the same moment. And as you can see in slow motion here, 
they fall down with exactly the same acceleration and they reach the ground at exactly the same moment. So it really is true that gravitational forces make objects, despite their mass or composition, drop with exactly the same acceleration. Let's dig a little deeper still. Why is this the case? Why is it that heavy objects fall just the same as light objects do if both of them drop just under gravity? When you lift a pouch of sand in one hand and a sheet of paper in the other, you can certainly feel that one of them wants to go down much more than the other one does. But once you actually drop them, all difference between the two is gone. Ultimately, this is because the mass of an object really means two things in physics. On the one hand, we recognize mass as the number that says how much the object is pulled by gravity. This is the mass that appears in the universal law of gravity and is formally called the gravitational mass of the object, mg. On the other hand, we also recognize mass as the resistance of an object against acceleration, how much that object does not want to change its motion. This is the mass as it appears in Newton's second law and is formally called the inertial mass, mi. Now, up until this day, nobody knows why, but gravitational mass and inertial mass are given by the exact same number. This is one of the unsolved mysteries of physics. But given that it is true, it means that if we apply Newton's second law to gravity, the m on both sides of the equation will cancel each other out, and whatever comes out is therefore going to be the same for all objects. Or, more physics he explained, a heavy object might be pulled down more by gravity, but it is also much more difficult to go into motion. And the light object might feel less gravity, but then again, it needs less to get into motion. Look at the symbol pendulum. There too, gravitational mass and inertial mass have dropped out of the calculation, and so all masses oscillate in exactly the same way. This is why the formula for the pendulum does not contain any mass. Now, this is what we call the weak equivalence principle. The fact that inertial mass and gravitational mass are given by the same number means that the motion due to gravity will be the same for all objects. And with that, we will return to Einstein. As we saw, he realized that gravitational forces and fictitious forces are fundamentally the same, as they both share the property that they make all masses move in exactly the same way, the happiest thought of Einstein's life. And with that, he understood that whenever you go to a non-inertia frame, you automatically get gravity built into your physics. The next step he made was that therefore, gravity can be seen as the curvature of space. To understand his thinking, let's take an example of a curved space. Let's make the surface of the Earth. If I take as my starting point some location on the equator, let's make it the Sahara, and I start walking towards the north, at some moment I will find myself ending up on the North Pole. Now if somebody else would have started at the Sahara and they would have walked to the north, they too would have found themselves ending up on the North Pole. In fact, every single thing, every object, every person, regardless of their mass and composition, if starting at the Sahara and walking up, would find themselves at some point at the North Pole. It's perfectly clear why this is the case. It's because the path of their walking is determined by the shape of the Earth, not by the object that is doing the moving. Einstein simply reversed this argument. If you find that every single object follows the exact same path, you can envision as if it is walking on a curved space. Later on, we will see that you can also see time as curved, but in order to get there, we first have to have gone through some special relativity and then we can connect everything together. The special relativity part will be in part two of the presentation and connecting everything together to make a curved space sign will happen in part three. Okay, let's recap what we have seen. We have seen that Newton's first law is not just a special case of the second law, it isn't. Newton's first law can do something that the second law cannot do. It can identify inertial frames. And that's very important because the rest of Newton's laws only hold in inertial frames but if you go in between inertia frames, you get fictitious forces and you cannot distinguish those from gravity because they have the exact same properties, the equivalence principle. And this means that you can see gravity to space and its curvature itself. Note 
that for none of these conclusions we have used any relativity so far. Everything has followed completely from Newton's laws alone. Now remember these conclusions as we will collect them later when we will discuss general relativity in part 3. But before we do so, we will first go to special relativity in part 2. In there, we will recap the base conclusions of special relativity and we will do something else there too, which is not very familiar. We will derive special relativity directly from Newton's laws alone. We intend to take our conclusions of part one on Newton's laws and build on them to get to general relativity. To do so, we first have to learn how space and time are connected. And that brings us to this intermezzo called part two, in which we will first arrive to rules of special relativity. Usually, these are deduced by looking at properties of light. But it turns out that this is very unnecessary. It turns out you can derive all of special relativity from Newton's laws alone, more specifically from the existence of inertial frames. So, let's take some slides to go through this derivation. Let's first take the conventional route that most people are familiar with, deriving special relativity from the properties of light. Historically, special relativity was born out of the Maxwell's equations, which were finalized in the mid-1800s. And these equations tell us that electric forces are mediated by an electric field E, and that magnetic forces are mediated by a magnetic field B. Originally, the electric field was found to be made by charges, and the magnetic field by moving charges, currents. In addition, the Maxwell's equations state that one can turn electric fields into magnetic fields and vice versa. To be specific, shaking an electric field around will produce a magnetic field, and shaking a magnetic field around will produce an electric field. This is, for instance, how a dynamo works that powers your bicycle light. The rotation of the bike wheel will wobble a magnet, so that its wobbling magnetic field produces an electric field, providing your bike with electricity. Hence, we consider electric and magnetic fields two sides of the same phenomenon. They can be turned into each other, the electromagnetic field. Maxwell then asked himself the following question. Could it be that the wobbling of an electric field makes a magnetic field, and the wobbling of that resulting magnetic field then makes an electric field, and the wobbling of that electric field again makes a magnetic field, so on and so forth, so you get this wobbling back and forth of electric and magnetic fields into each other, constantly turning into each other. And he used his own equations to figure this out. And this result leads to the starting point of special relativity. Maxwell found that the combined electric and magnetic fields, while wobbling continuously into each other, back and forth and back and forth, moves through space. That is, the wobbling travels. And the formula for this combined wobbling is given above, a formula that many of you will recognize as the wave equation. Now, if you want to know more on how Maxwell's equations lead to the wave equation and that the solution indeed is a wave that travels, there is side video 2 to view. And for those who want to skip the mathematics, this animation gives you the visual gist of it. The wave equation also predicts the velocity with which this wave travels through space. And its numerical velocity was calculated to be 300,000 kilometers per second. No measurement, a theoretical prediction. This is, of course, the speed of light. So without looking for it, Maxwell had discovered that light rays are just wobbly electric and magnetic fields. And a famous quote by him is given above. In easier words, light is electromagnetic waves. Here comes the historically important part. Maxwell's results do not go well with Newtonian mechanics. Usually, when you calculate the velocity of some moving thing, you have to specify with respect to what the thing is doing the moving. This is what we know from Newtonian mechanics. You cannot say how fast the car is moving without first having specified the coordinate system of the road. But the Maxwell's equations give the velocity of light without having said with respect to what they are being measured. The derivation of the wave equation on the previous slide does not care about the observer's inertia frame. The speed of light comes out the same always. So the Maxwell's equations seem to predict that the speed of light is the same in all inertial systems. There's a second oddity too. Magnetic fields are due to currents, moving charges. So if we travel along with a moving charge, 
then in that inertial system the charge will stand still with respect to us. No magnetic field, just an electric field. But had you seen the same charge in a reference system in which it was moving, you would have seen both the electric field as a magnetic field. So apparently, how much electric and magnetic field you see when looking at a charge is dependent from which inertial system you are viewing the charge. Yet, if you calculate how much this charge is pushing or pulling on the world around it, the net outcome will be the same. So even though the amount of E and the amount of B is dependent on inertia frame, the physical outcome of how much pushing and pulling will always come out the same. So it looks as if the Maxwell's equations tell us two things. The speed of light is the same in all inertial systems, and all inertial systems give the same physical outcomes, even if they don't agree on the amount of E and B fields. These two puzzles really rattled the physicists at the end of the 19th century. Famously, Einstein came along, still a young man at the time, and he flipped the script. Instead of trying to explain why the speed of light is the same in all inertial systems, and why all inertial systems give the same physics, he simply assumed that this was the case and worked his way from there, flipping the script. And these are now known as Einstein's two postulates. All inertial systems give the same physics, and the speed of light is the same in all of them. And he wrote this up in his famous 1905 paper on the electrodynamics of moving bodies. It's well worth a read. He derives all of special relativity using the Maxwell's equations, hence the title. Famously, he did not use the Michelson-Morley experiment that measured that the speed of light is the same in all inertial systems. He was aware of the experiment, but didn't need or use it in his derivation. He put all his trust in the Maxwell's equations. The most striking result of Einstein's paper is that the amount of time and the amount of distance cannot be the same in different inertial systems. Space and time are stretchable. Let's derive some of these results now. Let's look at one of those derivations as it is presented in many school books. This is not how Einstein did it, but it is the way that is presented very often to people who are new to special relativity by using a thought experiment, in nice German, a Gedanken experiment. The usual setup is that of a train, moving with respect to train tracks with a constant velocity v. On board of the train, some ray of light bounces around. By following the light ray from the inertial system of the train and from the inertial system of the tracks, making use of Einstein's postulates, we can relate how things look from the track compared to from the train. In this example, we would take a light ray shooting from the floor of the train to its ceiling, where it hits a mirror and then travels back to the floor, as you can see in the two panels here. How many seconds does it take the light ray to make the round trip? Well, from the inertial system of the train, this is a simple exercise. If the height of the train is L meters and the light goes with velocity c, then we immediately get that it takes 2 L over c seconds to make the round trip. It's times 2 as light has to go back up and down. This amount of time is conventionally called the proper time, given by the Greek letter tau. Proper time is the time measured in the inertial system in which beginning point and end point of a process, here, light making the round trip, happen at the same location. So the proper time, tau, is given by 2L over C. Let's now also look how long it takes the round trip of the light ray as seen from the inertial frame of the tracks. For such an observer, the calculation of the round trip time is more involved. After all, for them, the light does not shoot straight up or down, but under an angle as the train is moving along in the meantime. In the upper picture, the arrow gives the light ray's path on its way from floor to ceiling as seen by the track observer, and in the lower picture, the arrow gives the light ray's path on its way back down from ceiling to floor. How many seconds does the round trip take? Let's first note that the way up takes just as long as the way down. So, if we're smart, we just calculate the time for the upper part of the light ray's journey and then multiply it with 2 to get the time for the full round trip. So, we only have to focus on the upper picture. Draw a triangle. The amount of time to travel is, as always, just distance divided by the velocity. So, it will be the hypotenuse of the red triangle divided by c and then multiplied by 2 to get the full round trip time. The hypotenuse we can calculate using Pythagorean's theorem. We know that the triangle has vertical side L 
and its horizontal side is how much the train has moved forward while the light was doing its traveling from floor to ceiling divided by two, because that time is only half the total round trip time. That gives us the upper formula for the total round trip time delta t. Note that the desired amount of seconds delta t appears on both sides of the formula. Using some hi simple high school algebra, we can pry it out, which gives us the formula that we see now. And now we see that it contains 2L over C. And in the previous slide, we had identified that as the proper time delta tau, that is the amount of time measured by the observer on the train. Using that then finally gives us this formula. The relation between the amount of time measured on board of the train, delta tau, and is measured on the track delta t. Clearly, these two times are not equal and depend highly on the relative velocity v between the two inertial systems of the train and track. This famous formula is called time dilation and leads to all kinds of fun results on how much people age when traveling with high velocity. This was just one example of how a thought experiment can lead to formulas of special relativity. Again, it's not how Einstein did it in his famous 1905 paper, but it is the way that this is typically presented in school books. And many more of such thought experiments can be worked out, leading to a full deck of cards, the full set of equations relating the distances delta x and durations delta t as measured by different inertia systems moving along with velocity v with respect to each other. These are the famous Lorentz transforms. In words, if you move with high velocity, you will see distances compressed and time stretched out. The measure for how much of that compression and stretching happens is the Lorentz factor gamma given in the plot over here. It explodes when you get close to the speed of light, but as long as you stay to everyday velocities, the Lorentz factor is almost equal to one, meaning that in everyday life, you see little to nothing of the compression of space or the stretching of time. In everyday life, things look as they do in Newtonian mechanics, those fourth and fifth laws of Newton that we saw in part one. What we went through in the last few slides is what I would like to call the school book derivation of special relativity. And it does have its appeals. It's straightforward to follow. It's easy to visualize because everybody is used to light. And the mathematics is not that hard either. Ideal, therefore, for a high school curriculum, for instance. But upon closer inspection, there's a few things not quite right with it and might even lead to downright misconceptions in students and sometimes even in the teachers. For instance, an astute student might have some difficulty accepting the validity of the formulas found in this way. After all, we did the derivation by taking this one specific thought experiment and then promote its outcome to be true in all other cases as well. It's like proving Pythagorean's theorem by showing that it holds for one specific triangle, for instance, one with size 3, 4 and 5 will do nicely, and then claiming that it must therefore be true for all other triangles as well. To drive this point home, let's make this question more specific. We derived our relativity formulas using light. So why do we use these formulas also when describing physics that has no light in it whatsoever, for instance, radioactivity? We've taken one example and promoted its outcome to overall validity. And that is simply flawed logic. A second question a smart student might ask is, are the effects of relativity due to light taking some time to travel? For instance, time dilation. Does time really stretch when watching a moving clock? Or is it just that it takes a while for me to see the clock because the light has to travel from the clock to my eye and the clock is traveling away? A good question, as we do, in fact, make blatant use of light travel time in this school book derivation that we just went through. We explicitly did thought experiments in which we are setting light moved from one place to another in a train cart or so. So a student might have the takeaway message that the effects of relativity are because of the travel time of light, and they're not. Finally, our school book derivation tends to give the impression that special relativity only holds when things move with constant velocity. But that's wrong. Special relativity holds for accelerating objects perfectly fine. Otherwise, at particle accelerators, people wouldn't be allowed to use special relativity to begin with. No, special relativity holds when an observer is in an inertial frame. 
If you are in a non-inertia frame, you will need general relativity. But none of this is clear from the schoolbook derivation. It's in there somewhere, but it's buried deep. It's buried in the usage of the Maxwell's equations because those only hold in inertial systems. But this is buried so deep that to a student it is typically not very clear at all that special relativity holds in inertial systems and that the thing that you look at is completely, perfectly fine to accelerate. So I think there's a didactical point in doing a derivation of special relativity that uses no light whatsoever. No thought experiments, no postulates about light speed, not even that light exists. Instead, we can make use of Newton's first law alone. Simply the existence of inertia frames is enough to derive all of special relativity. And indeed, I did promise to get relativity from Newton's laws alone. So let's drop all other physics such as light and get special relativity only from Newtonian mechanics instead. It sounds pretty astounding. The claim that special relativity can be derived from inertia frames alone. This is because we always hear that special relativity comes from insights about light. But at the end of the day, relativity is a theory about space and time, not about what is moving in space and time, be it light or something else. This is why it also applies to physics where light plays no role, and it is also why we can expect that special relativity can be derived without using any light. I will go through the qualitative derivation, but will leave the mathematical steps aside. For those who would like to see these steps, please view side video 3 where I go through all of them. You can also read the scientific article that two colleagues and myself wrote about it in the link at the top of this slide. Finally, a student of mine, himself a teacher, translated this derivation as a website for students, where they are guided through the derivation, including exercises and hints and answers. And it's all in English. That link is given at the bottom of this slide. Feel free to skip this in the next few slides. Its outcome is just what we already know, special relativity. Okay, let's go through the main steps. We'll take two inertial systems, A and B. Since they are both inertial systems, their relative velocity V must necessarily be a constant. We will take a mass, and again I made it a ball, and we will have it move about with some velocity U. And we will simply ask the following question. If we know the distance traveled by the ball in the A system, can we calculate what the distance is as seen in the B system? And if we know how many seconds that took in the A system, can we calculate how many seconds it took in the B system? That is, what is the formula for delta x and delta t in the B system given delta x and delta t of the ball in the A system? It only takes little thought to realize that these formulas must necessarily be linear relationships. Delta x and delta t in B can at most depend on delta x and delta t in the A to the first power with some constants in front. Because if the powers were higher than the first, then their resulting derivatives would give velocities that are non-constant. But if the ball has no net forces acting on it in either of the two systems, they have to go with a constant velocity u in both systems, because they are inertial systems. So the absence of a net force, the acceleration should be zero. And that will not happen if I have powers of delta t and delta x that are higher than the first. So from the premise that A and B are inertial systems, we already know that the formula should look like this. Now note that there are four unknowns there gamma, kappa, beta, and sigma. We don't know what they are yet. Maybe gamma is equal to 1 and kappa is equal to 0. In that case, the amount of time is the same in both inertial systems and we simply regain Newtonian rules. But maybe they have some other values. And how can we find out? From mathematics, we know that if you have four unknowns, you will need four conditions to find their values. It's a little stronger too. The fact that the relationships are linear means that there is only one solution for these values. So if we have found gamma, kappa, sigma, and beta, we don't have to worry that it might not be the right values we are looking for. Once we have found a solution, we have found the solution. So we will need four conditions. And we can get these easily from Einstein's postulate that all inertial systems are equally valid. Let's do one of them. 
let's make the ball be at rest in system B. If so, then in system A it will have a velocity V. Also, it means that if we make the ball at rest in system A, then in system B it will be seen with a velocity minus V. So that gives us two conditions already. One more condition is this one. If you first use the formulas to go from system A to B, and then use the formulas to go back from system B to A, these two combined operations should give you the same outcome as if you had not jumped between systems at all and just stayed in system A all along. That's the third condition. Finally, the fourth condition comes from introducing a third inertial system, C, not pictured here. If we first use the formulas to jump from A to B, and then again to jump from B to C, the outcome should be the same as if you jumped from A immediately to C. That gives us the fourth condition. How to put this into mathematics can be seen in video 3 or the article or the website. And you will be guided through it using this website in nice uh, steps with hints and questions and answers. But the narrative should be clear. We had our four unknowns, but there were also now four conditions. And so we can find the value for the four unknown gamma, kappa, beta, and sigma. And if you then do so and substitute them back into these linear equations, lo and behold, you end up exactly with the Lorentz transforms that we saw already a few slides ago. In other words, we have found special relativity only by using inertial frames. But wait, I mentioned we never needed light. Yet there is a C in the formulas that we derived here. So did I smuggle in light after all? Not at all. The derivation allows for a constant to come in, one that is allowed to have any value at all. And people who have seen mathematical derivations before are used to this. Mathematics frequently predicts constants that are allowed to have any value. Sometimes that's due to integration. An integral equals an antiderivative plus a constant. And in some other cases, it is due to the algebra. And the latter is the case here too. The details you can find in the side video three or the article mentioned. Now I merely called this constant C to make the formula's notation agree with the usual notation. What I did not do is take this value to be 300,000 kilometers per second. I did not assume that this constant has anything to do with light rays, and I certainly did not assume that this constant is the same in all inertial systems. But there is something that I can conclude from the formulas alone, and that is that the constant has the unit of a meter per second. This follows from the fact that all terms in a formula must have the same unit. So whatever C is in physical meaning, it must be some velocity of something. But we can do a little bit better still. I can show that this C is the same in all inertial systems. Not by premise, not by postulate, but by derivation. If we take the two formulas that tell us how much distance the ball has moved and how long that took, and I divide them on each other, I will get a formula between the velocities of the ball as seen in the two inertial systems. Here's exactly what I do. I take the two formulas, I turn them into a ratio of distance traveled by the amount of time traveled, I do some trivia algebra, and then I get the formula that tells me how fast the ball is moving as seen in the B frame, UB, if I know how fast it was moving in the A frame, UA. And people might recognize this result as the relativistic velocity addition rule. The numerator gives you the Newtonian rule for adding velocities, and the denominator makes it relativistic. But now a cool thing happens. What if we make the ball go with this special velocity c? That is, let's substitute that u in system A is equal to that special velocity c. Then after some trivial algebra, we will see that ub also comes out to be equal to c. That is, if the ball goes with special velocity c in inertial system A, it will also go with this c in inertial system B. And this is true for any two inertial systems. The relative velocity v between the two systems drops out of the calculation. Long story short, the special velocity c that we have found is indeed the same in all inertial systems. 
So we have found Einstein's original starting point, not by postulate or by assumption, but as a mathematical consequence of inertia frames. So how about that? Special relativity, including Einstein's postulates, derived from inertia frames. For some of you, especially the engineering people, this might remind you of something from thermodynamics. Pretend that you are a person from a few hundred years back and you had no idea the temperature had something to do with bouncing particles on a microscopic level. How then would you define temperature? This is the way that temperature was defined back before they knew about bouncing particles. They took the following observation. If you take three systems of stuff, like barrels of matter or gases or so, and you bring them into contact, they will each change their properties until they don't. After a while, they will reach equilibrium. And this is not when the pressures of the barrels are the same or the volumes or the amounts of particles, but there must be some number that the barrels share that communicates that they have reached equilibrium. Indeed, you can formally prove that the fact of equilibrium leads to the existence of some constant that is shared by all three barrels. So the fact that all three barrels share the property of equilibrium means there exists a constant that is the same in all barrels. In very much the same way, the fact that all inertial systems share a property, here the absence of fictitious forces, means that there exists a constant that is the same in all inertial systems. And here it is the speed of light. It's the same type of mathematical derivation and you can find the temperature one in any good book on formal thermodynamics, typically under a chapter that is called the zeroth law of thermodynamics from which this proof follows. Okay, now the only thing we cannot find from our derivation of special relativity is the value of C and whether anything, light or otherwise, in nature actually travels with this velocity. And this simply becomes a matter of measurement. Take for instance two neutrons. Let one decay in your rest frame, that takes about 14 minutes on average. And let the other one decay while it's moving with respect to you. And then you measure the difference in decay time, and we have seen the time dilation formula that contains your unknown number c, and if you have the two times in it, you can deduce what the value of c is, and then you can even measure the value of c, and again, you don't even need light to do that measurement. And then, for reasons that we can only speculate about, it happens to be so that light happens to have that same value. Okay, that brings us to the recap of part two, our intermezzo on special relativity. What we have seen is that Maxwell's equations for electromagnetism predict that light is found to solve the wave equation. And since that wave equation does not require you to specify the inertial system, electromagnetism predicts that the speed of light is the same in all inertial systems. Electromagnetism also predicts that the laws of physics look the same in all inertial systems. And when Einstein took these as the two postulates, he could derive the Lorentz transforms, which fully encapsulates the rules of space and time that we now call special relativity. But what we also saw was the special relativity can also be fully derived from the existence of inertial frames alone, and no other postulates, let alone about light, is required at all. And this derivation sidesteps some common misconceptions about special relativity, including why other things except for light also obey special relativity, why relativity has nothing to do with waiting for light to reach your eye or your measuring apparatus, and it explains why it only holds in inertial systems. And with that, we can conclude our intermezzo of special relativity of part two and continue with our studies into gravity and move on to general relativity. Time to return to gravity in part three. In part two, we did a recap of special relativity, which told us how space and time are connected to each other. We did so in two ways, the historical schoolbook route based on light and a formal one based on Newton's laws, specifically the existence of inertial frames. And with an understanding of how space and time are connected in special relativity in our pocket, we can combine it with our conclusions of Newtonian gravity that we saw in part one and complete our building of general relativity. So let's continue with understanding gravity, but now relativistically. To recap what we learned earlier in part one of the presentation, if you go to a non-inertial frame, you will see objects move as if there is an extra force acting on them, and we call those fictitious forces. 
And by the equivalence principle, they behave exactly the same as gravitational forces. So if we go to a non-inertial frame, we automatically build in gravity. And that summarizes what we have seen in part one. Gravity is the price you pay for doing physics from a non-inertial frame. And all of this we got from Newtonian physics alone, including the notion of a curved space to describe gravity. Let's do the exact same thing now, but starting not from inertial systems in Newtonian physics, but from inertial systems in special relativity. So we are again going to take the rule for motion in an inertial system and view it from a non-inertial system, just as we did all the way back with the merry-go-round. From special relativity, constant motion is given here in the blue box. It simply says acceleration is equal to zero. Previously, with the merry-go-round, we went to a rotating system to derive the centrifugal force. But now we want to be as general as possible. We want to be able to go to any coordinate system, rotating, accelerating, bouncing, doing somersaults, you name it. It is this what gives the theory the name general relativity. We want formulas that hold in all reference systems and not just inertial systems. So we will do a coordinate transformation from this Newton's first law in special relativity and go to any new reference system. This will result in the following formula given here in the red box. The derivation of this formula is very technical, so I do it in side video 4. It's a tensor calculation, but please note that this is just the mathematics in which we express things. The tensory stuff does not add anything we didn't already physically discuss before. If you go to a non-inertial frame, you will find an acceleration. And this you can clearly see here too. The left-hand side in the red box expresses acceleration, and the right-hand side is non-zero. And that's exactly what we already saw in the Newtonian calculation too. In fact, for the centrifugal force, the merry-go-round, we saw that it contained the square of velocities. And this we see here too, because there's two velocities there. The Greek symbol gamma is called the Christoffel symbol. And the exact expression of the Christoffel symbol depends on which non-inertia frame we are now in. Its expression can be found inside video 4, and we don't need it for everything that will follow. The key point is, we started with the law of motion in an inertia system, the blue box, went to a non-inertia system by any coordinate transformation, and then we end up with the equation in the red box that tells us that in non-inertia systems, there is an acceleration. And this is the fictitious acceleration. And by the equivalence principle, we can see this as a gravitational acceleration. Case closed. Let's bring back in another notion that we already learned in Newtonian physics. There we saw that we could see gravity as a curvature of space. And that still holds here. The only difference is that we now have to talk about a curvature of not just space, but space and time. Already in special relativity, space and time got fused together by the Lorentz transforms that we derived ourselves. So now we are in general relativity, we still have a fused space-time, but now it's curved. This is why this red equation, called the geodesic equation, carries the Greek index mu. It labels the curvature not just in the three space dimensions, but also in the time dimension. Now where is the curvature? It's carried by the Christoffel symbol. That's where the curvature goes. So let's investigate how we can describe curvature. We will need a method to measure curvature. Now, how do mathematicians do it? Well, one easy way to find out whether a space is curved is by taking a rocket. You simply blast off from the surface, and when you are far enough away from the surface, you turn around and you simply look at the space you just came from. This is how we measure that the Earth is curved. Photos from our satellites confirm us so. But of course, this only works if we have a direction to blast our rocket into. In case of the two-dimensional surface of the Earth, we can always still go up. But if you want to know whether a three-dimensional space is curved, there is no extra direction to blast off into, and less so with the four-dimensional space-time that we are now interested in in general relativity. So we will need an intrinsic way to measure curvature, some trick that tells us curvature without having to leave the space-time itself. And such tricks fortunately do exist. 
and two of my former students will demonstrate this to you in this video. They are dressed as Greek ancient sages as the old Greeks already pondered the rules of geometry. And what Kai and Nelson are showing you here is that if you take a triangle on a flat surface, you try to import it on a sphere, things look very different. <laughs> there we go. What Kai and Nelson showed here is that the Pythagorean theorem does not hold on a curved space. And this is true for many rules of Euclidean geometry. For instance, the sum of the angles of a triangle does not equal 180 degrees. And two initially parallel lines do not stay parallel. And, as we now saw, the Pythagorean theorem does not hold anymore. So if you want to know whether your space-time is curved, simply draw a triangle and see whether Pythagorean theorem holds. If so, your space is flat, uncurved, and if not, you live in a curved space-time. In practice, your triangle better be very big. Curved space-times look pretty flat if you are zoomed in on them too much. Think about the curvature of the Earth that locally looks pretty flat, but it's a concept that matters. We measure curved space-times by their deviation from the rules of Euclidean geometry. Here's an example. On the left, we have a triangle drawn on a flat piece of paper. For this triangle, we can immediately write down Pythagorean's theorem. The length ds of the hypotenuse, its square actually, is equal to the sum of the squares of the sides dx and dy. The sides dx and dy contribute equally to the ds. When there's a third dimension z, then this triangle would not feel it, so its contribution to the s is zero. Hence, dx squared, dy squared, and dz squared get multiplied by 1, 1, and 0, respectively. However, if we were to draw the triangle on a curved space, such as a sphere, the situation follows as my students Kai and Nelson showed in the video. The theorem does not work anymore. On a sphere, we measure distance along the equator in d phi and along the meridian in d theta. But the hypotenuse, ds squared, is not the sum of the squares of d phi in d theta anymore. Instead, d theta squared has to be multiplied by the square of the radius r of the sphere and d phi squared by another sine squared theta. Now, how to derive this rule is not the important point here. If you want to know where this formula comes from, you can view side video number five. Skipping the derivation, the main point is that on a sphere, ds squared of a triangle is not the sum of the squares of the sides d theta and d phi. The numbers that multiply the contributions are not simply 1 and 1. So how can we measure the curvature of space? Well, we can simply collect the numbers in front of the contributions to the side of the triangle. If these are 1, 1 and 0, as we saw in the left panel of the flat space, then ds squared is as predicted by the Pythagorean theorem. If they are not 1 and 1, but something more complicated, as we see in the right panel, then the s squared is not as predicted by the Pythagorean theorem. So we really only need to look at the coefficients of these squares to spot a curved space-time. And that's exactly what the metric tensor does. It collects these coefficients. The metric tensor can be seen as the collection of numbers that measure deviations from Pythagorean's theorem. Now, these were some simple examples, not having to do with Einstein's relativity. Let's now look at two more examples that are actually from relativity. Let's start with the last panel again. We already saw in special relativity, part two, that space and time are combined and that their relationship is given by the Lorentz transforms that we derived. They predicted that the amount of time delta t and the amount of distance delta x, y, and z are not the same in different inertial systems. They can stretch and compress depending on the relative velocity v between inertial systems. However, there is a particular combination of delta t and delta x, y, and z that actually is the same in all inertial systems. It is this combination, called the s-squared, the compression of space 
is exactly cancelled by the stretching of time. And it's a fun exercise to give students. Start with this combination ds squared, replace all delta t and delta x by the Lorentz transforms, and after some high school algebra, you will find the exact same outcome as the, what they started out with. ds squared is the same in all inertial systems, even if the t squared and the x and dy and the z squared are not. So this gives us Pythagorean theorem again. The squares of the distances make up a ds squared. But this time, the duration dt squared also comes into play, with a minus c squared in front of it. So, as in the previous slide, we can collect the coefficients, which are now minus c uh, squared, 1, 1, and 1, to make up the metric tensor. And this metric tensor summarizes all of special relativity. And it is therefore deserving of its own name and symbol. We call it the Minkowski tensor, eta. Despite its difficult name, it's just the Lorentz transforms written up in Pythagorean's theorem. In other words, special relativity written as a type of geometry. Moving on to the right panel, let's look at an example from general relativity. There, we are not fixed by the Lorentz transforms anymore because we are allowed to go outside of inertial systems. And we can get a little more crazy. We can curve space-time so much that it has this big endless dent in the middle, and then we end up with Pythagorean's theorem, the s squared, that is wildly different than from the uncurved case. This particular case is a black hole, and its coefficients again combined together to make up a metric tensor, this time named the Schwarzschild metric tensor after its discoverer. The idea, however, is exactly the same over and over again. You write down Pythagorean's theorem, and you measure what the coefficients are in front of the sides of the triangle. And that collection is what we call the metric tensor and reveals whether Pythagorean's theorem holds and therefore whether you are in a curved space-time or non-curved space-time. And with that, we have found the mathematical ingredients for general relativity. The key object is the metric tensor that tells us how much Pythagorean's theorem is broken. In other words, how curved a space-time is. And we had already concluded that curved space-time gives us gravity by the equivalence principle. So, once we have the metric tensor, we have everything we want to know about gravity. And we even already found a formula that tells us how a mass is moving and accelerating due to gravity. This was the Judas equation of a few slides back. So, our work is almost done. Well, that is, we haven't figured out yet how curved a given space-time is. In other words, we don't have a formula yet that tells us the metric tensor. We only looked at two examples, Minkowski's metric tensor and Schwarzschild's metric tensor. So once we have a formula that predicts these metric tensors and the other ones, then our theory of general relativity will be complete. How to get this formula? Well, it took Einstein the better part of a decade to figure this out. He had a number of hints to guide him. One is that gravity must be the result of mass and energy. So his formula must, in some way, relate the metric tensor to mass. In fact, he also knew one very specific case. Newtonian gravity, Newton's universal law of gravity. So he knew that whatever his formula was going to be, it should at the very least predict Newton's universal law of gravity when applied to a single mass floating about in space. Finally, Einstein knew that his formula should hold in all reference systems, be they inertial or non-inertial. That's what you want in general relativity, that you have the freedom to go to any reference system. So he knew that his formula should also adhere to that principle. And these requirements were enough for Einstein to finally find the desired formula. It's this one. A more complete derivation I will show in the side video 6, but here's the upshot. These requirements are met by this famous Einstein field equations. They look pretty benign because they fit on only one line, but it is a very, very complicated set of formulas. It only looks simple due to the symbols used to hide the complicated stuff. In particular, on the left-hand side, you see a couple of symbols called R. This is where the complicated stuff of curvature is hidden. They are functions of the metric tensor. And hence, the whole left side of this equation is just one big expression for the metric tensor. In other words, the curvature. 
The right hand side is where the mass and energy are specified in this object called T. So, leaving all complicated mathematics tucked away in the symbols R and T, the formula simply reads that the curvature of space time, left hand side, is made by the presence of mass and energy on the right hand side. When T is zero, in other words, when there is no mass or energy around, this formula spits out the Minkowski metric tensor. In other words, in absence of masses, Einstein field equations simply predict special relativity. If T is not zero and there are some masses or energy around, the solution is not special relativity, but a curved spacetime. But it does take a lot of mass or energy to make that happen. And that is due to the very, very small value in front of the mass and energy object T. It contains Newton's constant G, which is a very small number, it's 10 to the power minus 11 in standard units, divided by a huge number, namely the speed of light to the fourth power. And the outcome is ridiculously small, about 10 to the power minus 45 in standard units. Now with such a small number multiplying the mass energy T, the right hand side of the field equations tend to be almost equal to zero. And therefore the formula predicts almost no curvature. It is only when T is large enough to compensate the 10 to the power minus 45, only then does some curvature come out. That is, it takes an enormous amount of energy to make space-time curved. Gravity is very weak. And that's why it takes a whole planet's worth of mass before you can finally feel some gravity and still not a lot of it because we can easily build rockets that overcome the gravity of the Earth. So here we have Einstein's general relativity summarized in one sentence. Gravity is the curvature of space-time. We can make the space-time curve by mass and energy and also make it stretch and even oscillate just as we can with a stretchy fabric. In fact, this is why general relativity tends to be, well, quote unquote, explained as in the picture. A heavy mass on a stretchy material makes it dent. And matter that comes close to the dent will roll in. Now, as a didactical tool, I slightly warn against this. You see, in order to make the curvature by the mass, we would already be assuming that there is a gravitational force pulling the ball downward, as in the case of a real mattress on which we place a ball. Also, the smaller mass rolling inward assumes an outside gravity. That is, this explanation is circular. It explains gravity by already assuming that there is gravity, which is all fine, of course. It does serve as a nice visualization, but not as an explanation. So for a real explanation, you really have to go to the Einstein field equations. Okay, in these final few slides, let's qualitatively look at some results of the Einstein field equations. We will not go through the mathematics of the solutions, but we will have enough understanding now to fully understand what's happening in these examples. And we'll look at three of them. The first is the bending of light. Let's take a mass big enough, the sun in this case, to curve space-time around this, as we can see in the picture above. The space-time is shown here as a blue corner system and it's curvature by the dent in it. Since everything on the space-time follows this curvature, light also doesn't go in a straight line. If a star is now behind the sun, the path of one of its light rays will be bent by the sun's curvature too, and this you can see in the picture. The light ray gets bent by the curvature and hence reaches the Earth's telescopes. So we can actually see stars behind the sun due to this bending. And this was a prediction made by Einstein himself, and it was measured for the first time in 1919, proving Einstein's theory right. This effect is now called gravitational lensing, and this was on the front page of many newspapers in 1919 because it showed that gravity really is different than Newton had predicted so many hundreds of years ago. By the by, very astute listeners might notice something here. Back in part one, when we introduced the curvature of space-time, we did so by appealing to the fact that all matter falls the same under gravity. Back then, we called it the weak equivalence principle, and we even saw it demonstrated in experiments of falling balls and feathers. But light is not a mass, and it doesn't play by Newton's laws. So we don't have the right to assume that the idea of curved space-time that we got from Newton's laws 
also applies to light. So by saying that gravitational lensing is true, we are secretly assuming that the equivalence principle doesn't just hold for material particles, but also holds for massless particles such as light or even gravity itself. And this upgraded version of the equivalence principle is called the strong equivalence principle, although the nomenclature is somewhat dependent on the author or whatever text you read on relativity. Here's the second example of a curved spacetime, the expansion of the universe. Einstein, but also scientists such as Lemaitre and Friedman, realized that if spacetime can curve, it can also stretch or shrink, dragging along stars and galaxies with it. So if you look at the universe, you should see the stars and galaxies move away from you, but also from each other. The amount of space between every two galaxies should increase. So a galaxy that is twice as far away has twice the space between it and us, so twice the amount of stretching. And a galaxy that is 10 times as far away will have 10 times the space in between it and us that stretches, giving us 10 times the amount of stretching. In other words, how much a galaxy recedes from us should be proportional to the distance it has between it and us. This is a strong prediction from general relativity that is now called Hubble's law. And Edwin Hubble, an astronomer, measured that this was true back in 1929. And he saw this when he looked at the galaxies. Indeed, they moved away from us and from each other, and the receding velocity was indeed proportional to the distance. This was another experimental verification of Einstein's formula. The third example of a curved spacetime is gravitational waves. We already saw that single masses can, if big enough, make spacetime curve, a piece they make a single dent in spacetime. But what if you have two of these masses and they start to attract each other and go into each other's orbit? A first guess might be that the two dents just add up. When two dents come together, they together make one big dent, much like two light rays have constructive interference, but it's more complicated than that. Here's a demonstration made by my colleague of NICAF, Erik Hennes. In it, you see space-time as a stretchy piece of fabric. And in Erik's hand, you see a drill. And instead of a drill, he has replaced it with two little balls. And each of those balls make their own little dent on the fabric. And if Erik now presses the button, the two balls will revolve around each other and we will end up with two orbiting dents. So let's see what we then get. And as we see, the fabric will not only curve, the curvature itself will travel outward. And everything along the way will bob along. Stars, galaxies, planets, they will all dance along with the space-time due to the two stars dancing around each other. Let's look at this process in a little bit more accurate detail. A stretchy piece of fabric behaves pretty much like space-time would, but a better idea can be obtained by actually solving the Einstein field equations in mathematical detail for this particular scenario. And that produces this video. In it, you see two stars making their own respective dance, but as they move around each other, space-time dances, but the space-time eats up some of their energy. And that goes at the cost of their orbital energy, making them get closer to each other up until the point that they merge together and you end up with one final star in the middle. This is called the final black hole. And you see this beautiful set of gravitational waves being sent out. This process is our third example of what the Einstein field equations predict. When fully calculated, it looks like the picture that you see above. From left to right is a time frame. You start with the two stars orbiting each other. This is called the inspiral phase. At some point they start melting into each other, that's the merger phase, and this final black hole then shakes or wobbles about for a little bit more until it goes to rest, and this is called the ring down. And that gives a very particular shape as predicted by the Einstein field equations. So this is what it should look like in theory. And this was measured. The two LIGO gravitation wave detectors were the first in the world to be sensitive enough to feel the dancing of the space-time due to two black holes spiraling into each other. The measurement is given here, showing clearly that Einstein's formula again gave the right prediction. And this was the famous first detection of gravitational waves, done on the 14th of September 2015 and made public in 2017, leading to the Nobel Prize immediately in 2017.
Since that first detection, a network of gravitational wave detectors have formed all over the world, including the European Virgo detector and the Kagera detector in Japan. As of this recording, almost 100 gravitational wave signals have been measured, leading to a wealth of information on all kinds of fundamental physics, astronomy and cosmology. Now, I cannot do it full justice in this one video, but here are some immediate results. Using gravitational waves, we can study black holes, the details of nucleonic materials in neutron stars, the expansion rate of the universe, and do precision tests of general relativity itself. Most importantly, gravitational waves can be produced by everything that has mass, so there is literally nothing in the universe that cannot, in principle, be detected by gravitational waves. Also, the fact that gravity is so weak means that the gravitational wave is hardly disturbed by whatever it encounters on its way from source to our detectors, giving an extremely clean signal of what we see in the universe. Now please contrast this to light that is easily perturbed and contaminated while traveling, and is not even sent out by much of the universe at all. For instance, dark energy and dark matter do not send out light, being completely invisible to our light telescopes but gravitational waves allow us the opportunity to figure out once and for all what dark energy and dark matter is. So, we find ourselves at a very special time in the history of science. Now that we have gravitational waves, we will investigate the biggest mysteries of the universe and we will see things that no one has ever seen before. And with the upcoming next generation detectors, such as the Einstein Telescope and the Cosmic Explorer, we can really expect a treasure trove to be opened. So there's very, very exciting times ahead. So let's wrap up. We've made a very big journey, starting from Newtonian physics all the way to the current understanding of gravity, space, time and the universe. We started by looking exclusively at Newton's laws and concluded that if you look in between inertia frames, Newton's laws gives you fictitious forces. And since their resulting accelerations are the same for all objects, and gravity has the same property, the equivalence principle states that gravitational forces and fictitious forces are indistinguishable from each other, and that allowed us to see gravity as a property of the curvature of space. That was part one. Then we went to part two, where we saw that special relativity relates space and time to each other, and as a result, we can expand our conclusions of curved space to that of curved space-time. In part 3 then, by looking in between inertial frames starting now from special relativity, we derived a formula for relativistic acceleration, the geodesic equation, and by demanding that the curvature, the metric tensor, produces Newton's universal gravity law and should hold in all reference frames, we also found the formula for the metric tensor, the curvature, gravity, given the amount of mass and energy around. And that result is the Einstein field equation. And this wraps up general relativity, built up from Newton's laws alone. The geodesic equation tells us how masses should move given curvature, and the Einstein field equations tell us how curved space-time is given mass and energy.